With Meghan and Harry, uh, going back to what you were saying before, I get the feeling it might just be my YouTube bubble that Americans don't necessarily believe her um, about the race and the unconscious bias. Yeah, I think she, she's she's kind of gone too far this time. I mean, remember, this is only through her own uh, spokesperson, in effect, Scobie. But, you know, she's, it would be very easy for her to come forward and say, look, there's been a huge misunderstanding here. I never said anyone was racist, and I'm sorry for any upset it's caused. But her silence I speaks, uh, speaks volumes. Mm -hmm. But also, the, you know, the version of the story has changed. You know, it was one person, then it was two, mm -hmm. the suggestions that maybe three. It was told to Harry. Uh, it was concern rather than anything else. So the whole story has moved each time. Uh, and so I think, you know, and she's been shown to, to, to be a liar on so many things. I mean, the car ch chase in the center of Manhattan where no traffic moves at more than five miles an hour. Mm. Um, so that was insidious, really, to, to play on the memory of Diana in that way. It, yes, yes. She's very cynical and not very bright. Um, mm. And, you know, I think people even in the States are getting wise to her. I think we've been wise to her for a long time. And, and when I was interviewing for my Matt Batten book, which was came out in 2000 and, 19. So this is a good six, seven, six years ago. There was concern then about Meghan. Um, and that was even, I think, before they got married. Mm. So I think people knew what, you know, where she was coming from. And, you know, the whole history, the fact that she's fallen out with her own family, she's, you know, cancelled all her friends, I, I think is, is quite revealing about her character. Mm. Eventually, the buck stops with, with somebody and, you know, maybe maybe her. The I mean, this is actually, I didn't even think to ask you this, but this could be interesting. As, as you're a publisher, how could Omid Scobie's book, a manuscript of it, and I think we can name who was named now because everyone has, because Piers Morgan did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They named Charles and Kate, was it? And even then, it's not clear because it appears that Kate is just talking in a letter to Charles about that I don't even know, but about whether the baby, I mean, and then, and then there's a separate question about if that's racist at all, because most people yeah. don't think it is. It's, exactly. it's curiosity. Yeah. But how did that get into the Dutch translation? Uh, I think what happened was that uh, an early version of the manuscript before it had been properly legaled uh, was sent for translation. So not, what normally happens is the book comes in, it's edited, it will then have a legal read and things will be taken out. Uh, and clearly it put the names in um, uh, and they were taken out for the British and other editions. Uh, um, but uh, through some cock-up, uh, the, the version was sent to Holland uh, and they didn't get the final version. That's one explanation. But I think it's interesting that Holland is the smallest territory that you can sell rights to. So if you're going to pulp a book, that's the best territory to do it in. Oh. It's only about two or 3,000 copies. Oh, so I like if this. If you want an excuse <laughs> to get a story out and claim it's a cock up, then sending it through, doing it through the Dutch publishers. What oh. will be interesting is the, his agent has taken the blame for it. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see what happens, whether action is taken against the agent for that. Um, uh, and I mean, we all have to have insurance to cover cock-ups like that, that we might just inadvertently make, or, or if the whole thing goes quiet. So that's what I would uh, recommend, see what, what happens, what f actions are taken, because the Dutch publisher will have lost money, clearly, at pulping a book and having to reprint it. Uh, and who's going to, to make up that cost? Mm, interesting. What about Luxembourg, is that not an area? Be Belgium? Well, those wouldn't be separate territories. I mean, Holland is a separate territory. I mean, the other thing is Holland is such a small territory because they all speak English anyway. So they're very, you know, th that's why the runs there are so small because everyone's going to buy it in English anyway. Uh, and the cost of translation is high. Uh, why would you bother translating it to people who could read it, who want to buy it and could read it in English anyway? And that's true of Scandinavia as well, but they're slightly bigger markets. Interesting. I, I'm really fascinated by that. I was. I did wonder because so obviously there is a, a conspiracy around. You know, people are wondering was this done as a PR stunt because it got so many more people talking about the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 I think my instinct would be towards the PR stunt. You know that, that, wow. that there was. A, you know, they, they could they could say that it was an, a, a genuine accident, but um, these are accidents, particularly on a high sensitive book like that, don't happen. You know, you are very, very careful what you send out. We don't send out anything which hasn't been legaled already to anyone, you know, whether it's for serial or whether it's for foreign rights. Mm. So it doesn't really get beyond the editor and the lawyer uh, until it is in a fit state to go up because you could be sued. So uh, I'm, I'm a little cynical about the whole exercise.
And then he says he never wrote, Omis Scobie never even wrote this in any manuscript. manuscripts. It, it's, well, that must be a complete lie. It has to be, doesn't no it? No one, no a translator that only translates, as they said, they don't add anything. I felt really sorry for the translator that sort of doorstepped her and, she, you know, this poor woman who's... Just doing her job. Doing her job. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you can't trust anything Scobie says either. No. You know, I think the interesting thing is supposedly it's only sold six and a half thousand copies because I think one of the sad things is, you know, you can write the complete rubbish and people out of curiosity will buy the book. I mean, Spare is a good example, which I think is the fastest selling book ever um, yeah. and has made him a lot of money. Um, and it's based on a tissue of lies. Uh, so, or his own truth, shall we say. Um, so, you know, that has made a lot of money by being sensationalist. Uh, and, you know, it's annoying if you're trying to write serious books, which you're trying to tell the truth rather than just being sensationalist. And those books won't sell as well. But it's, it's you know, it's like taking a diet. If you mm. have a diet saying, you know, eat less and a diet saying just eat tomatoes, you know which one will be the best seller. <laughs> but Scobie's book didn't sell well and it was sensationalist. So, uh, well, this one hasn't sold well. The first book did. Right. I, I, was, I read some reviews saying, you know, the worst thing you can say about a book, which is that it was boring. Well, you know, I think there are a lot of people there who are interested in the Meghan Harry story and will buy anything. Um, and a lot of people are very sympathetic and feel that they've been introduced by the royal family and the press. But, you know, my own feeling is, you know, the press responded to Meghan uh, and the royal family did too, with open arms. They tried to to integrate her. Uh, and uh, I don't buy the story that, that, you know, she was forced out. She, she wanted to have everything on her own terms. And, you know, the point is that when you join the royal family, you know, there's certain rules you behave, mm -hmm. you, you follow. Uh, you can't commercialize your activities. You have to behave with a certain amount of dignity. And, and I've heard, you know, she's like Fergie. She, she hasn't done that. Yeah. Uh, I, I saw, yeah, it's a weird one, isn't it? Because I guess growing up when I was younger, I'd have felt a little bit more uh, about individual liberty. And it's like, you, you, you know, you should be able to do what you want, go in there and then you can be ambitious and do your thing. And I think as I've gotten a bit older, I'm now seeing it as like, well, I don't believe that the serendipitous falling in love with a prince happens just like, you know, I think you go after Prince Harry because you want to be part of that well, family. Well, there's quite a lot of evidence that, I mean, you should claim not to know anything about him and yet she has sort of posters and, on, of him on the wall and talked about him. <laughs> so, I mean, I, you know, again, you can't believe that story and I mean, the various intermediaries, how they met as that story has changed. Mm. But it's not about liberty. I mean, if she wants to go off as a, a member of the public and do things, mm. that's fine. But she's doing it as a member of the royal family. You know, if they want a title for their children. Uh, they still, of course, have the title Duke and Duchess of, of, of Sussex. Uh, and, you know, you can't have it both ways. You know, if you take the title, you, you, you have to, to do the job. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you can be playing Mrs. Mountbatten Windsor, um, but she's not going to get the endorsements and the attention if she has that. Would it have been possible for her to go in, and maybe Diana did this, or to go in and maybe ruffle a few feathers, but still be beloved, uh, still be seen, perceived to have done the duty of a royal, but being able to achieve maybe her ambitions, which is to be a bit of a, a model and a book writer and these kinds of things? Well, I think everything was possible when she went in. And the Queen, for example, gave her the job of dealing with the Commonwealth, which would have been good, which would have played to what she thinks, you know, the issues she thinks are important. I mean, she goes on about racism. Mm -hmm. um, so I think people tried to to, 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 to to create a package that would play to her strengths. But, you know, she wants, to, she doesn't want, she's not a team player. Uh, and she wants, you know, she wants to make a lot of money, which you can't do clearly in the royal family. Um, she wanted to be controversial, which you can't be. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it really wasn't going to work. Uh, you can't be half in, half out, I think was the line from the Queen. And she's absolutely right. Mm. Have they, is, is, does history just, does history just repeat itself with um, Edward and, and Wallace Simpson, with The Traitor King, which is another book you've written? Uh, tell me a bit about some of the parallels. Well, there are interesting parallels. I mean, this is another case, uh, for those who don't know the story of Edward VIII, this man who gave up the throne to marry an American divorcee. Um, uh, and so, okay, it's it's someone who, was, who inherited as opposed to was the spare. But, you know, the behavior afterwards is, is very similar. There's the same fight, for example, over status, over titles. Uh, there's the same falling out with the family uh, and siblings. There's the same debates over money, uh, security, the curation of the story, uh, working with tame journalists and biographers, uh, trying to sue the press. 
uh, endorsing the most inappropriate things like cutlery and bed linen, mm. uh, m- mixing with sort of trash, basically, you know, uh, cafe society. Yeah. Um, so there are lots and lots of parallels. And I think if they'd looked at those parallels, they, there might have been a lesson there for them. I w- there was a quote I've got. Uh- Loney, as in you, reveals a couple obsessed with their status, financially exploiting their position and manipulating the media. Filled with treachery and betrayal, this is a story of an exiled royal and why the royal family never forgave him for choosing love over duty. And I read that thinking that could be I, that, that could be Harry well, and Meghan. Or I think that was deliberate. That was done by, that's the, the publisher's blurb uh, <laughs> on Amazon. But exactly. And, that, you know, and a lot of people, you know, I think have bought the book because they're interested in the parallels. Um, I mean, there are also certain parallels, for example, with, with Andrew, who is the spare. Mm. And it's the same prob- um, uh, problem there of, of, uh, as with Harry, of, of trying to find a role for them when their characters aren't perhaps very suitable. I mean, cause clearly Edward and mm. Anne have found roles. But Andrew, for example, likes money and golf, which is exactly what the Duke of Windsor liked. Uh, so, you know, you do see patterns of behavior, the same sort of um, uh, standing on ceremony that the Duke of Windsor had, the, the pomposity and the arrogance you see again in Andrew. So there are, mm. I mean, the trope of the crown, I think, is very good. It's, it's, it's the debate between public duty and private pleasure. And the rogue royals that I write about want private pleasure, the Fergies, the Andrews, the Duke of Windsors. Um, and then you have the, 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 the dignified public servants who personify the monarchy. So the George V, George VI, mm. the Queen, I mean, even Prince Philip, yeah. uh, Princess Anne, Prince Charles, and Kate and, Kate and William, exactly. Mm. Um, so, you know, and, and, and those are the two strands. And, and the problems arise when the, the, the ones who, who want to have a good time and use their position just for their own pleasure cause problems for all the others who are, you know, putting their heads down and getting on with the job. It is a difficult one, because as I was alluding to before, that I do like the idea of the rascal, the rebel, the, rebel, the, the heretic. That's what this show is about. And I, I like the idea that people are going, I'm not going to... Because Kate, uh, Kate and William, are they're, they're fine and nice, and I have a lot of respect for them, but they're a little bit dull, I think. Well, you know? I, they have to be. I'm sure behind... It's yeah. a bit like the Queen. You know, I feel very sorry, because clearly here was a woman who was highly intelligent, great mimic, great sense of humor, and could never really show that in public. I mean, people talk about it, you know, in private and with mm. their family, and could be pretty acerbic and pretty ruthless. Um, but we have this, you know, image um, uh, of her as this rather saintly figure. Mm. Uh, and, you know, that's the problem. You know, we, we don't, Badgett, who's the great sort of writer about uh, the monarchy, said we don't want to let light in. And the problem is they have to let light in. They, they need the media to promote what they're doing. Uh, and, you know, when everyone has a smartphone and people are less deferential, their their behavior will be recorded. I mean, if you remember when Harry was on holiday with friends in Las Vegas and got into a, a stripping game with, at the pool table, um, someone just pulled out a mobile phone and snapped him and it was front page of the tabloids yeah. the next day. So they, it's very difficult to have a private life. And this, of course, is the great debate for people writing about them. Where does the private life stop and the public life begin? You know, is it legitimate to talk about, for example, marital problems? But, you know, marital problems, for example, with Prince Charles and then and Diana had a huge, you know, um, uh, it was very important in terms of the constitution and what would happen. You know, would would she be queen if they were divorced? Um, could Camilla be, be, be queen as a divorcee? Um, you know, all the questions that, that bedeviled Edward VIII was sort of coming back into play with, with Charles. Mm, it's fascinating. There's also the, as we've alluded to as well, the, the sort of Hamlet, Shakespeare problem of the spare. Obviously, a lot of people don't have all that much sympathy for Harry because of the way he's gone about things. But you've seen it with Andrew, you've seen it with Harry. Edward's different, but maybe didn't feel like he was right, you know, for that, for the role or, or whatever, felt a bit of an outsider. That's quite a, a psychologically dangerous place to be in, I suppose. Well, I mean, they've managed it in the past. So if you think going back, um, George the Sixth was was the spare, and he didn't inherit. Um, but he had several brothers. The Duke of Kent, for example, had a job in the civil service at one point, mm. uh, and you know who knows what would have happened. He died during the Second World War in a plane crash. But the Duke of Gloucester, for example, had an army career. Mm. You think of Prince Michael of Kent. The Duke of Kent had army careers. Um, uh, Andrew had a career for 20 years in the Navy. I mean, in, in, the best thing would have been if he could have stayed. The problem was it's an up and out system in the Navy and he'd reached basically the, the level of his talents. He wasn't going to be promoted. Uh, and that was the problem also with Harry, um, that Harry really wasn't going to go much further. 
But you know the, the services are a good uh, environment. They're protected. Uh, you know they can't go out in the town. They're probably stuck on a base or a ship or something. Uh, they have a discipline there, and they have a camaraderie, and they're treated as equals. Uh, Andrew found it very difficult for when he said, he had, "You know, I don't quite know when I wear my <laughs> prince's hat. Uh, you know, when am I a naval officer and when am I a royal?" Uh, you know, he'd have this bizarre thing where the, 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 the ship would dock at a port and he'd been reporting to the captain of the ship. And then he'd he'd go and inspect some troops and the captain would be walking three steps behind him. So it's a very difficult balance, but plenty of them have managed it. Edward, for a while, had a career in, in, in uh, with a theatre company and, and that only collapsed um, because there was a sort of leak. I mean, he he was stitched up um because he was filming william at st andrews but i mean he that uh, I, you know i think that's he could have continued to work in the theater if he'd wanted to mm -hmm. you know others like angus ogilvy who's married to princess alexandra had a career in the city so uh, you know there are opportunities for them yeah. i mean both the duke of york's children have jobs uh, i wouldn't say they have careers but they one works, I think, in the art world and one works in finance. So it's perfectly possible for Harry to have found a role if he had chosen to, to do so. Yeah. And there's a full-time ro role as a royal and doing the charity work. Um, you don't have to go off and become a painter and decorator.